Um, and today I'm going to talk about a couple things. First, I want to talk about the alarm homework, which you all did. Um, and then I'm going to talk about locks. <clears throat> and I draw a lot of the discussion from the locking homework that hopefully you all did. Um, and then talk about locks in X6. Okay, so first, um, the alarm handler homework. So if you recall, the assignment was uh, that the user space program wanted to arrange for the kernel to have an, an alarm handler called every every once in a while, every however many ticks of the hardware um, hardware clock. And this is actually something that real operating systems support and is pretty important for any kind of real time uh, sort of anything in the user program that has to happen in real time. And in fact, the kind of mechanism you all built is something that all is that specific machinery is something that's sort of called back from the kernel back to the user space. Um, a very common piece of machinery. So, um, what's the basic trick for getting from the kernel in the interrupt handler um, and causing execution to start in the user alarm handler? Somehow, have to get from the kernel into the user alarm handler. Yeah, so yes. So the basic trick is to in the tra in the trap handler in the kernel to set the EIP that was saved in the trap frame to the EIP to the address of the alarm handler that was supplied by the user function. Um, so where does that trap frame? You know, this is trap frame that you see declared on line 37 in the trap handler. Where does that trap frame come from? Where does the EIP slot in the trap frame come from? Yeah, it's set during the, when the hardware in the happens, it's forced by this timer hardware, pauses wherever the user program lies, and um, pushes a bunch of registers that constitute the trap frame on the stack. And the EIP is pushed by the hardware um, during the interrupt. And it's going to be read, that, that EIP is going to be read when um, the kernel finally interrupts the return from interrupt, executes the return from interrupt instruction. Um, so that means the user alarm handler will start executing as soon as the assembly language that called trap returns back into what we're doing there instead of at the instructions just interrupted. Um, okay, so that's how we get into the user track handler. However, with, what happens when the user track handler returns? What do we want to have happen? Should be going where the code where the user program originally was. Yeah, the user program is interrupted by this timer interrupt. We'd like to resume there and not somewhere else. Okay. Um, so what's the trick that we can use in order to ensure that the, when the alarm handler returns, it goes back to whatever instruction was in, originally interrupted? What's the trick that we can use so that the alarm, user alarm handler returns to the place that was originally interrupted and doesn't just crash? Or yeah. Well, we can push the old EIP onto the stack. That's exactly right. So the answer is that the kernel, the trap handler, um, I'll show you the code here, which is probably almost exactly the code you wrote. Um, the trap handler prepares, it, it basically pushes um, the old EIP onto the stack so that when the alarm handler, you know, presumably the last instruction, the user alarm handler is a return instruction, that instruction will pop something off the stack and basically jump to whatever that value is. That's what the return does. So we're going to kind of fake it out here by, um, at line 64 and 65, uh, pushing onto the stack the old the, the old EIP, EIP from the trap frame where the user program is interrupted. All right. So this is like, you know, these lines I'm showing are, are sort of the answer to the homework assignment. Are there any questions about this? <clears throat> All right. Um, why can't we just call the handler directly? This is sort of a bogus question. 
But um, why can't I just say, you know, Yeah, so you could call this, and with the way XP6 works, it would actually jump, since the user memory is mapped into the kernel at the same addresses that's mapped into the user program, this line I've written at 64, which is totally bogus, by the way, um, it's absolutely the wrong answer, this would actually execute the user alarm handler. Um, and the user alarm handler would return back to the trap routine, and the trap routine would return back to user space, and everything would sort of go on like it should. Um, so why is why is this a really bad idea? There's no checks on what the alarm network is pointing to as executing in the kernel. Yeah, so we're, I'm, this would cause a user user supplied instructions to execute with kernel privilege, right? So that user friendly wouldn't be able to do anything. Um, so this is sort of a disaster. You know, one of the sort of basic things we try want to try to ensure with kernel um, is that. User programs are isolated so that they can they can only affect their own memory and not reach out and read and destroy kernel memory or other programs. This would be a terrible violation of um, isolation. Um, as it happens, the code I presented here is also terribly insecure. Um, can somebody tell me why this code, even though even without the direct call, is a big mistake? You could provide any. Uh, set order you want. And so you can overwrite here the IP where you want that part of the alarm handler and the IP to any uh, arbitrary yeah. address. So the only thing at this point in the code here that we can say is that ESP is a register that is, has whatever value the user program put there. Right? We, we sort of, I think of it as the stack pointer, but it's totally not the stack pointer here. This is just a register. 32 bit value, the user program can store anything if there it likes. Um, and so, for example, the user program could have stored a pointer to someplace inside the kernel there. Right? And then the line of code that I've marked would go ahead and write the user program counter, which the user program also controls, <coughs> to an address in the kernel, perhaps, or in another program chosen by the user program. So, this, this unchecked writing through the user stack pointer is uh, a disaster. So, you would want to present. Uh, perceive this by some sort of check, which is, is the ESP and ESP minus four in, you know, within the back, on a page that, uh, in the region of virtual memory that the user program is allowed to read and write. Okay. Any final questions before I abandon this topic? Okay. What's the most elegant way to make sure all the state registers? So you, you, you're talking about um, the call caller C registers. Is that um, well? Yeah, I mean, so you don't you want after the the user trap handler returns, we want all the registers to be okay. Okay, so this code also has the problem that it return, you know it. The, the trap trace has a copy of all the registers, all the user registers. And so, yeah, when we return from the trap, we'll restore all the user registers, except it'll be executing in the alarm handler. And the alarm handler may scribble junk over a bunch of the registers and then return back to wherever the interrupt occurred in the user program. Now, with scribbled on registers, right? Because the alarm handler doesn't know enough to restore stuff out of the trap frame. It doesn't know anything about the trap frame. So uh, a correct, and so that, that means that this code is actually incorrect that I'm showing here. A correct implementation would somehow arrange for uh, all of, basically all the registers in the trap frame, let's say, to be restored to the original values after the alarm handler returns. But for the way this is set up, we don't have a way to intervene because the alarm handler returns directly uh, to whatever instruction was interrupted. So, um, the answer is it's going to be a bit ugly, but one possibility is to stick some instructions in the user space, have the trap handler stick some instructions in the user space that and have and have um, line 65 actually push the address of those instructions in user space 
So that's where the alarm handler returns to. And have those instructions know that they should pop off the user stack a bunch of saved registers, including whatever it is, including the address of the instruction that it should return to. Um, and that's sometimes called a train from the lead, sort of little area and user space that the kernel arranges for the handler to return to that then does the user. One other solution we've seen is you can just push a bogus return address onto the stack that guarantees to generate a page fault to a very, at a very specific memory address. And when you receive that page fault, you know that the alarm handler has just finished executing and you can repair the trap there. Yeah, it's probably actually better because then the kernel gets control again. And in the real world, there's some other cleanup stuff the kernel's going to want to do, like prevent re-entrant alarm handler. Well, that's then the kernel has to be somewhat defensively programmed to right. say, well, well, or you choose an address which is a page which you know is guaranteed not that. Yeah. Sure, right. But you still have to make sure the yeah. So the code I put up is clean. The stuff we're talking about is <clears throat> a little bit involved. Okay, good. Now I want to switch to locking. So, um, the reason to talk about locking is that the kernel is full of shared data, right? Data that's going to be used by maybe multiple processes, or um, in, a, in particular on a multiple processor, might be used for multiple cores. Um, and so we need some sort of plan, some strategy for how multiple cores can access the same, the same shared data in the kernel without stepping on each other's feet. Uh, and there's actually a lot of ways of doing that, um, many of them very clever. We're going to talk about a particularly straightforward scheme that people have worked out involving locks. Right? And we're not going to talk too much about more clever things. Um, but locks do help you sort out uh, concurrent access to shared data. Um, however, they're, they're a big source of problems. Uh, it turns out a lot of problems people run into are locking problems, uh, so it's worth understanding them. Um, both how they work and how to use them in order to try to avoid bugs. And the locking strategy is often critical to getting high performance by means of parallel speed up. That is, if you would like your kernel on your you know, 16 core machine to run sort of 16, 18 times as fast as a kernel on a single core machine, um, one of the many things you've got to get right is um, cooking up a locking strategy for shared data that doesn't prevent the cores from making parallel progress. Okay, so uh, we can get into this very conveniently by talking about the homework assignment you all did, the ph.c parallel hash table thing that um, all of you added locks to for sometime last week. Uh, okay, so the, the, the basic scheme that that program and any multiprocessor kernel is living in is that you have a bunch of CPUs. The hardware provides you with a bunch of CPUs or cores. Um, the cores, sort of at least notionally, are attached to a um, system bus that allows them to read and write memory, and the memory system, a bunch of RAM or whatever, is hanging off that system bus. Um, and you store the kernel's going to store whatever program it is going to store its, its shared state and RAM and the different CPUs are going to uh, reach out across the bus and read and write that shared state. Uh, and for this program, the shared state we really care about is uh, that hash table, right? There's this hash table sitting there. Um, with, a, with, I guess, <clears throat> five slots. Um, they're all going to want to read and write that. So this is the sort of game we're playing. The, the reason for this architecture, this hardware setup, uh, you know, what life would be very much simpler if it was just one CPU. The reason to have more than one CPU, more than one core, is just performance. Right? It's the only reason for it. If you're not interested in performance, then you, know, you should never share memory among multiple CPUs. So we're only like we're only going down this road to performance. And if you're not getting performance out of it, uh, we shouldn't even take a single step. In the direction we're going. Okay, so we're hoping to get more performance out of our four cores than we would out of one. And there's already critical assumptions 
And that's that the bottleneck in this system is CPU time. That is the limiting resource. None of this makes sense unless the limiting resource is performing the CPU time. Right? There are absolutely programs for which the limiting bottleneck resource is access to the RAM. And for those programs, all of this stuff is the state. Right? You should use one core and somehow use the RAM less intensely. But from now on, we're going to assume that when we want to get performance, the limiting resource is CPU time and not the memory. And that we're going to get performance by dividing up the work somehow, dividing up the total amount of work among the different cores and letting the cores execute in parallel and not have to wait for each other. Right? So this is all about what's what we call parallel speed up. So all the time when we're talking about locking, in the back of our heads is going to be always are we going to get parallel speed up? Are we going to get parallel speed up? Right? If whatever we do some crazy thing, we don't, don't end up getting allowing CPUs to literally make to do work in parallel, um, then we should rethink the whole project and do something else. All right. Um, now, unfortunately, well, usually what happens is you spend 95% of your time trying to set up locks in a way that doesn't have bugs. And 5% of your time you think about parallel speed. But you got to keep in mind that the ultimate point was <clears throat> to run your program faster by running it parallel. OK. Um, so back to our, uh, back to the homework. Here's, I've run for you the original PH program. Right? I'm showing you the run times on one core and on two cores. And as you can see, um, on one core, the total amount of time is that pH spent inserting values in the hash table is a little over one second. Right? And on two cores, doing the same total amount of work that is inserting the same set of entries in the hash tables, um, each of the two cores took 0 0.2 seconds. But since they were running in parallel, the total wall clock time um, was 0 0.6 seconds, right? Even though they were doing the same amount of work, they split the work in half, roughly, almost actually exactly. Um, we're each doing half of the work in parallel on, on two cores. And so that means that the net effect is that the puts got done in a little over half the time on two cores, right? Which is a triumph of parallel programming. Right? We got our, by running this pH program on two cores, splitting up the work on two cores, we ran almost twice as fast. We could have maybe, through a cleverer program, we could have reduced that to 0.5, but you know, that's the most you can expect. Um, so what's the fly in the ointment here? Why are we, uh, why are we not done in the pH? Yeah. yeah, you know, there's a mistake somewhere, because <laughs> when the program went back and looked for all the keys that were inserted, a bunch of them were missing. Uh, so it's clearly a problem. Um, what is the problem? Anybody characterize? Where are those keys go? Like 20 keys missing. Where are they? Uh, two threads are trying to write to the same place, and so one of them writes and the other one can give you a variety. Yeah, so at some point, um, two of the cores are going to try to insert uh, a new, you know, the hash, this hash table. Let me try it. Draw the hash table out a bigger. Uh, this is the table. It's got those five slots. Uh, each slot points to a linked list of uh, elements in the hash table. Uh, you know, suppose that the current state of the hash table is that we have you know, 10, 25, 50 current elements in this chain, uh, in this, this hash table. The problem comes up when we have two cores. And one of the cores is trying to insert, let's say, 15, and the other core is trying to insert, say, 20. They both need to insert these you know, by the rules of how the code works and sort of in setting order. They both need to be inserted between 10 and 25. If they both run at the same time, let's say, running the same instructions at the same time, they're both going to allocate a new list element from now on. They're both going to 
we're going to see that their right is between here, and they're both going to set the next pointer to 25. Then, then they're both going to try to set this next pointer to point to their new element. Um, now, in fact, the memory system serializes writes to the same address. That is, if you have a bunch of cores and they're literally trying to write exactly the same address at exactly the same time, you don't get mishmash, luckily. Um, you actually, the memory system actually executes those stores to the same address one time in some order that the memory system chooses. Right? So these, you know, both of the cores are trying to write this very same memory location with two different values. The memory system executes one and then the other, and the second one, whoever happens to win. Well, I, you know, what, what literally happens is that one of the stores occurs, and then instantly later, the second store overwrites the second store of memory overwrites. So the end situation is that one of the two items got linked into the list, and the other two is there's no reference to it. Um, and this is how apparently this happened 20 times during my execution, and we lost 20 items. Um, this is called either a race. Um, or sort of more precisely at the lost update. Um, now, at this point we have two choices. We don't know what the person writing this code intended, right? You know, because we don't have a spec. Um, it could be that this was just the intended result, and they have some very tricky reason why this is okay, and something like it could, could be very fast, so maybe this is all right. Or it could be that they actually meant to have sort of the put had the obvious semantics where you add something to the hash table, and it really does get added to the hash table, in which case this is a mistake. So I'm going to assume that the programmer didn't mean to do this. Right? And the reason to bring this up is because there's plenty of tricky code out there, and not this code, but things that operate in parallel without locks, where the programmer is well aware of what's going on and has some strategy, and you know, it's, it's not using locks, I call performance, and has some strategy for recovery from this, like checking and retrying, for example. But we're going to assume it's simply a mistake, and there's a bug in the code. Um, so we need to stick locks into the code. That's our task. We need to fix this bug, fix these lost updates by sticking locks into the code. Where should we put the locks? Is there more than one choice? Around whatever sequence of instructions you want to be atomic. Yes. Yes. Um, and so what's that sequence? Is there only one answer? Yes. So one possibility in order to get rid of these lost updates is to simply put a lock around the entire hash table model. Have one lock, and at the beginning of every routine, like in particular, put and get, just acquire the one lock, do whatever you're going to do to the hash table, and when we are totally done, you release the lock. Right? So I'll call this a big lock. one or the other of these cores would get the lock first, and that core would do the entire put, link in its new element, before the other core was even allowed to look at the hash table and then release its lock. And then the second core would get its lock, and the second core would see, um, because it's not running in parallel with the first core, right? the locks prevent parallelism. Right? Because if I don't have the lock, then you have to wait for me to release it. So the locks are really there to prevent parallel execution. Right? The second core would be waiting for the lock, and then when the first core was finished with the entire hash table, the second core would see um, this new state and would realize, oh, it's got to link its, its element in between the pin and twin. Right? And the locks prevent any parallel access to the hash table, thus turning our incorrect code into correct code. Um, is this the only way to add locks to this? What's another plan? <coughs> 
Yeah, so a lot per bucket. Um, another possibility would be to have basically have another array of lots, one per bucket. Uh, and after a put or get had figured out which bucket it was going to need to, you know, which list it was going to have to change, it would first acquire the lock on that bucket and then go ahead um, and do whatever it was going to do. And basically, the argument for why it's correct is the same there. You know, you can't, um, only one core at a time can do anything to a list. And the second core has to wait for the first core to complete the finish. So this is a finer grain lock. Okay? Much of this is a lot of slot. So big lock will call coarse grain. Smaller blocks that detect smaller amounts of data are often called fine grains. So, um, is there any? Uh, if we have to do any thinking in order to uh, convince ourselves that it was okay, it's correct to have a lock. I think it is, so this is like a little bit of a hypothetical question, but why might it not have been, under what circumstances uh, would it not be okay to use, not be straightforward to use a lock for slot? Like if the last element of one slot points to the first element of the next slot. Right, so we're definitely depending on the different slots being totally independent, right? If there was some crazy way in which they related, related, like, what you were saying, or maybe there's some situation in which you need to move something atomically from one slot to another. Um, or, for example, supposing as the hash table grew, we wanted to grow the table, right? The table starts out with only five slots, which is a bit ridiculous. You know, maybe when it fills up, it has to get, have a lot of elements. Oh, we want to add more slots to the end and reshuffle the elements. That's going to be very difficult. It's going to be more difficult with per slot locks than it is with a global lock on the table. Because if there's a global lock on the table, the whole table, we can just take the lock out, do whatever we want, and then we'll be able to look at, you know, add new slots, reshuffle the elements, and then unlock. Whereas a lock for slot, it's a lot harder to see how we would grow or shrink the hash table. Okay. Um, so what's the what? So what's the advantage of the lock for slot? That's right. <laughs> okay. So the bummer with the big lock, the, the big plus, is that um, it's simple. And it requires hardly any assumptions about how, you know, not about assumptions, hardly anything about how the hash table works. Right? It could grow or shrink itself or move the elements between slots or move but we wouldn't care. We just slap a huge lock around the hash table. Um, and we're going to get that one. Just get rid of all the parents and elements. Assuming implementation is correct on the same um, The big minus is that indeed you're going to get absolutely no parallel speed up inside the hash table. You can never be more than one core executed inside the hash table. No parallel speed up. Uh, is that a disaster? Does that mean that my, you know, the style of course swing walk around the entire data structure is never useful? It's not a disaster. It depends on how often the hash table is. Yeah. If my program spends 99% of its time doing puts and gets, this, this may be a problem for performance. If it spends 1% of its time doing puts or gets, it's not going to make much difference. Right? We might be able to make our program 1% faster by using a very more sophisticated locking scheme, but the 1% may not work very much. Um, especially if it introduces bugs or requires programmer fraud. Um, so, the slot per lock, then, the big plus um, that we get by using finer grain locks is we might actually get parallel speed up. Um, and the minus is that there's more assumptions on how the code works. And so it's going to be easier if somebody decides to modify our hash table package to grow the hash table, it's all of a sudden going to break the code or break the lock. More assumptions, which means more bugs. 
even this parallel speed up is, well, the parallel speed up itself is only likely, right? If, you know, if there's two cores, it depends on the workload. If, if it's often the case that two cores need to use the same slot in the hash table, then this isn't going to get its parallel speed up either. And so you can imagine even more sophisticated locking schemes. Like you can imagine a locking scheme in which there was a lock associated with every entry in every list, right? And when you decided you wanted to insert something between the 10 and the 25, you know, you lock the 10 and 25 and insert between there. And that means that you could be inserting here while another four was inserting somewhere else in the same list. Um, and I hear such things are possible, but I tried to do it this morning and uh, I couldn't get it to work after like half an hour. So this kind of clever, for me at least, there's a point easily reached beyond which finer and finer, more clever locking schemes are sort of more programmer effort than, than it's worth blocking. So. All right. Um, okay, one final question. Um, it's clear that put needs to lock, otherwise you get these lost updates. Does get need to lock? <coughs> If you're doing any sort of putting while you're getting, then you do because when I do my understanding, but if you're just reading it, you can't Yeah, certainly in this in this program, get did not need to lock. There was no bug that adding locks to get would fix. Um, because it never ran well, who knows what, but didn't have a bug that adding locks would fix. Almost certainly in a real program, you would need locks with get. Um, although, um, well, it's worth thinking through. Um, the reasons are actually very subtle. If you look at closely at how the program works, it never changes the previous the insert. It never changes the previous pointer um, until what the, the new entry the previous pointer is going to point to is going to appear. So you could argue, um, you could argue, and correctly as it happens, that it's always the case that either this pointer points here or this pointer points there, and that therefore no observing get can see any problem. Get will either see the old list or the new list. Therefore, locks aren't required. It turns out that kind of tricky reasoning um, will lead you to trouble. <laughs> it's possible to make systems work based on that style of reasoning, but it's quite difficult to make a lot of defaults. If you add put, if you add locks to get, then <clears throat> you won't have to change it as well. All right. Any questions about the homework? Let me, let me talk about locks a bit more in the abstract and then um, go on to talk about XP6. So, locks really are, they're a data structure, they're an abstraction of this tool, and it's good to sort of understand uh, what the tool is that you're using. So, uh, in particular, there's almost always an actual data type, a lock data type, and each lock is an actual object. Right, so you're going to say you're going to declare a lock, declare an object of type lock, right? um, and then code can call acquire um, L, and you know then modify whatever it's going to modify. Let's say increment encounter, um, and then call release. And then the acquire, just to make sure we're all on the same page, the acquire. The implementation of prior and release has to make sure that only one thread or one core can ever hold the lock at a time. If anybody, if any core tries to acquire a particular lock while a different core or thread, or while the lock is already held, the acquire is going to wait for the lock to be released, and only then will acquire return. So there's some sort of waiting thing going on inside the acquire. Um, something to note about this is that 
even though when you look at this code, maybe what you think is, oh, lock L is protecting variable X. Right? That's a very natural thing to think when you look at this code. Right? In fact, that's just in your head, or just in the programmer's head. There's no actual enforced relationship between L and X. Right, the, the, you know, the, the programmer may well have been thinking while he was writing this code, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to declare a lock, and the purpose of this lock is to make sure that only one core at a time ever modifies X. But we, you know, that's not required. The programmer could be thinking of something quite different. Um, um, and this is sort of an important, for, for, this is, for this particular style of locking that XV6 uses, this is an important aspect of it. These are these lock objects that you can use however you like and with whatever convention the programmer wants in order um, to protect data. And there are certainly systems that have totally different approaches to the relationship between locks and data. Um, um, the reason to have explicit, the, the reason to have, to allow the programmer to declare lock objects explicitly, one excellent reason for that is so that a program can have more than one lock object. Right? Why would you ever want to have more than one lock object? Locks have different things. Locks have different things. So why is it important to have locks and different things? Because yeah, so if there was only one lock, supposing even if you said this, the system internally just implemented a sort of blue off the programmer and said, well, tough luck, you declare two locks, I'm just going to implement one lock because I'm lazy, and anytime anybody ever tries to lock anything, I'm just going to lock that lock, that one lock. That actually, oh, well, this, this might lead to trouble eventually, but um, that's merely a conservative implementation. Right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna, at least in the short term, not gonna directly lead to problems. Right? The reason, as you said, it gives the programmer to, the freedom to declare multiple locks um, is so that the programmer can sort of implicitly describe what parts of the program can run in parallel. Um, that is, if the programmer declares two locks and uses, you know, one core takes out one lock and the other core takes out one lock, then those two cores can execute in parallel. Whereas if there were just the one lock, then only one core or the other could execute and the other one would have to wait. So in a way, if your program has 57 different locks, one way of viewing that is that uh, there seem to be, there may be 57 different activities that can go on in parallel or 57 different variables that can be updated in parallel. Um, and one consequence is that you, if you have 58 cores, you almost certainly um, can't get parallelism out of them when accessing lock data. So in our hash table example, um, if you have a lock for slot, that means you have only five locks because n buckets is five in that program. If there's only five locks, that means that five cores can make progress in parallel if you're lucky, but six can't, six or more can't. Um, so one way to view, oh, you can have lots and lots of locks is a lot of programs express where the parallel, indirectly where the parallelism is in the program. Um, one way to think about, so, at least for me, what I'm usually faced with is I have some program which I either wrote or at least thought out without thinking about parallelism. And now I've got to figure out a way to add lots to it um, to make it work on a parallel computer. And it's a sort of typical setup. And so, um, indeed, one way of thinking, just in order to sort of make progress writing um, things like kernels on a, on a parallel machine, you need to have some method. You need to have some fairly systematic method for how you're going to write the parallel parts of the program, and in particular, how you're going to use locks. And so it's worthwhile to be thinking like, what scheme you can use, what approach you can use um, for locking your program. Um, one way that this can go um, is that the programmer can think of themselves as writing serial code, right? So maybe the programmer's just gonna write a bunch of functions that the programmer reasons about as if there were just one core, just one CPU. So the programmer writes a function that 
has some code in it that uh, where it will be too complicated to think about whether this works, you know, with 14 different cores or executing at the same time, the programmer only needs to think through, aha, each, each program is only going to execute as if there were no other cores in the entire user. Right? It's, it's just too hard to write programs directly that are correct under parallel. So we're just going to ask the programmer to write serial functions and then add in locks to actually make that assumption true. Because right? what locks are doing is forcing one at a time, one core at a time execution. So the programmer is going to think, aha, you know, this block of code I sat down and I worked out is not approved, at least some sort of informal reasoning for why this was correct when executed on a single process processor. Um, and we're going to add and acquire uh, and a release so that we don't have to do any further thought. What would be acquire effectively is if, if um, one, one thing that the acquire might be doing is forcing serial execution and therefore establishing the assumptions under which uh, the programmer had originally decided the code was okay. Um, and so, um, but this is just one way of thinking. Before we get to a somewhat more sophisticated way of uh, thinking about adding blocks, um, let's consider the question of whether it would be possible for the compiler to do the locking automatically for you. Right? You could imagine um, a system in which the compiler noticed, in which the compiler automatically, for every variable it decided to share, uh, sort of created a lock to go along with that variable, so the whole object. That every, every object had a sort of implicit lock that the programmer never saw associated with it. Um, and that anytime you use a variable, the compiler would stick a lock around that variable to make sure that it was only ever used by one core. Um, so this would be some sort of automated lock. Um, so the question is whether that makes sense. It is the rule for using locks so simple that you can just say, every time you use data that must be shared, you got to first acquire the lock and then release it. Not really. Critical sections can be more than one line long. And this is already kind of done with the memory system. Yeah, so, so one answer is that you can get a little way doing this. For very, very simple situations, there's automated schemes, um, which essentially, insert the locks for you. But once you're, once you're, once the operations you do on shared data start to be a little bit complicated, um, then this approach stops working. So a very simple place that you know, maybe the compiler could figure out, but I'll still say it, um, where this automatic locking starts to be suspect is supposing you write a function that says, you know, some temp equal x, where x is shared data, right? N equals N plus one, and then X equals. Right? You know, probably we meant this whole sequence here to, uh, to sort of, well, probably what we meant to do is add one to X, right? This is sort of a low level way of expressing. This is probably what the actual instructions look like on the machine. Um, but, but if we had some sort of automated locking scheme, it wouldn't be enough to insert and acquire here and a release here, right? That is called put locks around every use of a shared variable, right? Because, and then another acquire and pair here, right? If we want to get increment, then really somebody has to be smart enough to know that we put the acquire before the whole sequence and the release after the whole sequence. So this is sort of a stupid example of of why you probably can't have automated blocking. Um, let me give you a, a, a much more serious situation where how to put the locks in is really something that can only the programmer 
Suppose we were implementing a VD, right, to a file system call, um, where you give it two file names and it renames, the, moves the first file, the file with the first name, to have the second name. So you might um, rename the file from directory one, um, you might take the file X and directory one is one and rename it to the file Y in directory B2. Um, so there's sort of two operations that have to happen to this code. To implement this, are we need to erase uh, x from d1, and we need to add an entry for file y. Almost certainly in your file system, there's going to be a lock associated with each directory, right? So that nobody, as your you know, erase is going to be some potentially complicated operation. You don't want other processes, other system calls, to be able to peek at the intermediate state of the directory while you're in the middle of manipulating it. Um, so it's going to be a lock in directory one and a lock in directory two. Um, so we know we're going to be acquiring the lock in directory one inside your name and it would be similar. And the same with lock in directory two. So where should the acquire for directory two go? Where should we where should we pick up the lock for directory two? Where should we pick up the lock for directory one? Yeah. Yeah, so in fact, the right answer is we want to acquire um, the directory one lock and acquire the directory two lock before we do anything and release them both. Afterwards. So why is that? Why can't we do the more straightforward? Like, you know, if you're just saying, well, there should be a lock associated with every piece of shared information, then you always have to hold that piece of information locked while you're manipulating that information. Right? That simple analysis would say that while we're doing the erase, we should hold the lock of V1. And why we're, while we're doing the add, we should hold the lock of V2. Why is that not right? Because we don't want to erase yeah, because the sort of higher level semantics of rename is that to the external observer, either the rename should have happened or not happened. That is, the rename needs to be atomic. Um, and, uh, and it's for most system calls, um, it's quite important that, or for most system calls, they're defined to be atomic. That is, you're not supposed to, if you, if you look at these directories while this rename is happening, you're not supposed to be some be able to see some weird internal state in which maybe X is missing, but Y hasn't been created yet. The right? rename is supposed to be atomic. Um, and then in order to make it atomic, we actually need to acquire both blocks first so that nobody can peek in, no open or LS or whatever, can peek in in the middle and see uh, that X is missing and Y is not here yet. In order to make this atomic, we have to acquire both blocks first and release them at the end. And so this is another example in which a straightforward sort of, oh, we have to lock every piece of shared data um, while it's being used is not quite good enough. You actually need to, in order to put the locks in the right place, you need to be reasoning, use a style of reasoning that says, well, look, this whole function we named needs to be atomic. And so I need to add locks in to cause it to be atomic, that is to cause it so that nobody can see any in intermediate states while I'm doing the multiple updates are required inside the reading. Right. So when you say that locks are less about like explicitly eliminating the errors, it's more about like maintaining the invariance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit of a continuum, but the point is that very simple uses of locking um, can be viewed as just, you know, it's this piece of data, somebody was doing an update, you know, we don't want to lose the update. But more generally, what lots are really doing is saying, well, you know, we have some complicated set of invariants in our data structure, um, and the data structure has many locks in it. At the beginning of each operation, we need to pick up the locks that will be required to make our updates atomic. That is, so nobody can see the fact that in the middle we were violating the invariants and release the locks only when we restored all the invariants. And so you can think of the locks as either tools for 
ensuring atomicity of, sort of multi complex multi-step operations. The tools are making complex multi-step operations. And usually you think of them in terms of invariants that are, <clears throat> there's some set of invariants going into this function. We mess them up while holding locks and then release the locks only when these okay, are true again. Okay. Any questions? For your automatic locking strategy, can you also just like specify that you want this entire lock to be? Yeah. So the automatic locking strategy is not is not a is not a completely worthless idea at all. You can, you can push on this. You, know, you can make more and more sophisticated automatic locking strategies with some success. People have definitely done it. But the reason why it's not straightforward is that many a lot, it, the reason why it's merely not straightforward, not literally impossible, is that in order to get it right, you need to be reasoning at the level of, oh, I have complex operations that need to be common, rather than operating thinking at the level, well, I have a piece of data, every access to it must be wrapped in a lock. Right? This, this is really the right level of thinking in order to add locks to it. Um, and because, well, because it's difficult to actually think this through in a complicated program, this is just renamed. In fact, this is just a highly simplified version of renaming. The real rename is in the conservative model. Locking strategies more complicated um, because every single system call, for example, in the kernel it has to be thought about at this level. This is why it's so attractive to use coarse grain locks if you possibly can. Right? This is actually a lot of thought that's required to build in just to each system call like this that has some sort of complicated story about updating a lot of different um, variables and you know the sort of reasoning that says why a particular set of locks is correct. Is is a bit of a pain. Um, if you only want to do it, if it <clears throat> there's a real performance payoff. So in the case of directory, there may well be. But the reason why we would have per directory locks rather than, for example, a single lock around the entire file system is because we're imagining that different programs at the same time might be modifying the different directories. And if that's happening, then this lock per directory thing may pay off in terms of getting parallel speed up. Um, but if, in fact, most programs are in fact, if there's only one active program, <coughs> typically, or all the programs are nesting in the same directory, like for example, slash temp, then this is a much less, and this is a lot of complexity, but possibly low payoff. All right, um, so here's an example in which we actually, we, this is an example that used two locks. And we're using, in the end, using the two locks to be able to get parallel speed up um, for operations on different directories. One downside of having more than one lock in your system is that uh, if you're not careful, you're going to get deadlock. So we can actually cook up a deadlock, dead, you know, deadlocking the situation where the system gets into a state from which it can never proceed. Um, and so uh, if you think of rename. As taking you know symbolic arguments like you know who cares about the file? Let's just think about d1 and d2. Or d1 and d2 are variables. And then what the code does is um, first it locks d1 and then it locks d2. This will almost certainly eventually deadlock. Right? And the reason is that at some point, um, some other core at the same time is going to call rename with D2 and D1, that is the same two directories, but called in the reverse order. Like one program is moving a file from D1 slash X to D2 slash Y, while another program is moving D2 slash A back to D1 slash B or something. Because right? then the second program is it's going to lock its first argument first. <coughs> right, so Assuming they run it both at the same time, these first two locks will both succeed. Let's assume nobody else is locking anything. <clears throat> so now D1 is locked and D2 is locked. This attempt, and then they'll both go on to the second, acquire the second lock. This attempt to um, acquire lock D2, of course, has to wait for this guy to release it. 
And this attempt to apply to one has to wait for this uh, other process, another four, to first produce one. Uh, so both of these two locks are going to be, or two lock acquisitions are going to wait forever. And so this is dead lock. And anytime you have a system with more than one lock in it, um, you have to think carefully in order to avoid deadlock. So what's the what's the strategy that might be useful um, to help you avoid deadlock? Yeah. So um, the answer was always lock in lexicographic lexicographic order. So the sort of slightly more abstract version of this is that whenever you're writing a program that has multiple locks, um, and there are parts of the code that need to hold two locks at the same time, um, <clears throat> you should always make sure that everywhere in the code always, when it's going to acquire multiple locks, acquires them in the same order. Um, so and you just need to pick some order. It almost doesn't matter what it is, but there has to be some ordering on the locks. And Every part of the code has to obey that order. So, for example, if all the locks are directory locks on main directories, and there's only one directory namespace, we could just sort the names and say, look, if you're going to lock two directories, you got to lock the one with the lower alphabetic name first, which means that what your name would have to do is look at its two arguments and sort them by name and lock in that order. Right? So then this rename would look at these two and say, oh, D1 is, comes before D2 in the dictionary, so I'm going to lock one first. And in this example, that would work out fine because then the second rename would lock D1 first and would have to wait until the first rename had completely finished and release both its locks before the third one. Um, this is a big pain. Right? So the answer is um, there has to be some global order of locks. Very annoying because what this means is that um, any point in the code that locks has to be aware, you know, that, that takes out a lock and then calls some functions and whatever, has to be aware of all the locks that might be acquired by the function that it calls while it's holding its lock. Right? And in fact, all the locks have to be pulled up to the level at which the first lock is acquired. So whenever you enter a sequence of code that you know, take that's gonna take multiple locks, at the beginning of that sequence of code, you have to be able to, you have to predict what locks all the functions you call are going to need, even though you haven't called them yet. And you know, get the list of all those locks, sort them lexicographically or whatever, and then pre-acquire all the locks um, in that order. Right? Which is just very ugly. Right? It, it means that that, you know, when I call functions, the, the, what the functions do internally is no longer their private business. And usually, you like to write functions using conceal, you have the functions provide abstract interfaces, so here's what I do, I'm not going to tell you how I do it. But now, because the caller has to know what locks you're going to take out, that means the caller has to know a fair amount of what you're doing. Right? And so that's why you see comments all throughout, like kernel, for example, saying, oh, before you call this function, you know, the caller must hold lock, whatever. Be documented and it's often documented more or less informally. Um, and sort of code just seems in the wrong place. You know, I have to take out a lock here because way down the road it's the function that is called by a function that I call that lock T. I have to call take the lock out now because I need to ensure that it's going to have in the order. Right, so this is a way that one way in which lock just makes code ugly. A process can like reclaim a lock if they like, already have it, so they could just not know what the function needs to do, and they need to get the lock again if the process already has it. You have a caller. So if, if you're like running a process and you say, like, ah, uh, like if you want to get lock one, and then you get lock one again, so we can be able to run through this and you get lock one because that process already has the lock. This is all that needs starting. If I didn't guess correctly. So I think I took out lock one, and then you used lock two, but that wasn't the correct order. Uh, there's only you mean in the correct order. So it would just be that your, your function function is called, which is lock locally. 
But, you, but do, do you still have to box things in advance? I'm not, I mean, if you don't box things in advance, you may end up having already. I don't think I understand. Um, there, there, I guess like the, the point would be like that when you acquire a lot, it is owned by the process, and if you try and acquire it again, the process will tell you that you already have this one. Then you would wait for the process to release the lock that you try to acquire. Uh, we should talk about the right now. Uh, there are certainly there are um, there are more automated ways to get around this. Like databases in particular have ways of detecting. There are systems that let deadlocks happen, detect them on the fly, um, and have various strategies for breaking them. Although usually that involves restarting operations, sort of backing up operations that took out locks in the wrong order, and letting them. Sort of undoing everything you did and letting them restart. Um, but and, um, operating systems tend not to do that because it's very complicated. Uh, operating, <coughs> typically operating systems just live with, oh, you've got to pre-lock things in the right order. Um, OK. Um, So let's switch now to looking at how locking is actually implemented in XD6. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, by looking at the use of locks in, in somewhere, IDE.c. In particular, an IDE RW. So we're in our IDE at RW, and the, the, uh, the game here is that. This is the sort of low-level function that sends read and write, block read and write requests to the disk. Um, and you know, of course, multiple processes may read files at the same time. So there can be lots of operations that different processes would like to have the disk perform for them. So one way of looking at this is that we have you know, various user programs running up here in user space. Uh, and down in the kernel, there's a file system module, which turns open in the, in the file system calls it the read and write to the disk. Um, and so when I call read or something, the read sort of passes through the file system. There can be two processes that are read at the same time. Um, there's a disk out here. We need to send the reads and writes to the disk. But the disk can only do one typical disk, or at least xv 6s disk, can only do one thing at a time. Um, one read at a time, one write at a time. There's no two processes want to read, the disk is not going to sort that out for you. So, what XD6 does is um, it maintains a queue called the IDE queue of pending requests. Um, and IDE RW uh, looks at the incoming requests and appends them to the end of the queue. Um, and also, IDE RW at all times sort of make sure that whatever disk request is at the head of the queue is actually has been sent to the disk and the disk is sort of thinking about it and will eventually finish the read or write. When the disk finishes the read or write of whatever the sort of, uh, request is at the head of the queue, the disk forces an interrupt and the interrupt goes to uh, IDE inter. And IDE inter knows what was being executed because it's the request at the head of the queue. So it takes the data that was read or written, sort of passes it back to the file system, tells the file system, look, this request is the head of the queue, it's finished, and then IDE and her deletes the item from the whole, whole item, finished item from the head of the queue, and goes on to the next item. Comes back to the so that's the basic routine. And this, at this level, this is a classic device driver arrangement. This queue that's appended to basically at the low levels of system calls, um, and then the interrupt that wakes up whoever was waiting for the request and sends off the next request um, to the hardware. But you can see this in this, um, this function, IE RW takes a buffer as an argument. The buffer is sort of a set of directions saying, look, the file system wants to use block 17, or write block 17. Um, and the IE, IDE drive has a single lock, the IDE lock. And while the IDE RW does everything while holding the 
lock. So the things that the lock protects are, first of all, it avoids races and lost updates when it's uh, at the direction of the queue lock, or whatever, when it's appending, <clears throat> it appends the new request to the queue, and the lock prevents lost updates to the queue of waiting this request. The second thing the lock does um, is that it ensures the invariant that if there's any work to be done, the disk is always executing the request at the head of the queue. So we always know what the disk is doing. So when it interrupts, we can sort of figure out how oh, it is just finish. Oh, finish the thing at the head of the queue. So the next thing that the lock protects is the invariant at line 146 that we're always executing um, whatever the operation is at the head of the queue. So if it used to be empty, now we have to start the operation. That's what IDE start does. Um, the next invariant that's protected is that the, um, the IDE hardware sort of interface is just a bunch of little hardware registers you can read or write. And um, it's just too complicated to have more than one core talking to IDE hardware at the same time. And so another thing that the IDE lock enforces is that only one core is ever talking to the IDE. Otherwise, it would just be chaos. Um, and finally, and this is a topic for a future lecture, the, uh, the lock helps ensure that the process is, that it's clear when the interrupt comes in, which process to wake up to tell, look, your disk request is finished. And that's what this mess down at 150 to 150 does. Right, so this one lock uh, is enforcing all these embarrassments required to get the code correct. And the way the code was written, I can tell you, is that it was first written to be correct, assuming only one core. Right? So this was originally single core code. Um, and then when we converted x 6 to work on multiple cores, um, because the disk itself only could do one thing at a time, it seemed very natural to just basically have a big lock around the entire IDE system. And so that's we took our original code with no locks that just correct everything on a single core and just slapped a big lock around the whole IDE module. Um, the other interesting place that um, uses the lock is the interrupt handler. It's called when the disk says it's finished. The entire interrupt handler operates inside the lock. And so that means, by the way, that you can acquire locks at the interrupt level, which is, we're going to see, how some interesting concepts. Um, the entire interrupt machine runs inside the lock, and the lock basically, because the interrupt handler has to do almost all the same things that IDE RW has to do, like talk to the disk hardware to tell it about the next request, um, manipulate the queue of waiting requests, the lock is sort of protecting the same set of things at this level too. Um, all right, any, any questions about what IDE code is doing with locks? In a way, uh, what the, there's two things in it. One is, there's a whole lot of things that are protected by one lock. And that's totally classic for locks. There's a bunch of locks in it. There's some locks in XC6 that very clearly protect just this one piece of data. But there's others which I'm not sure I can even tell you all the invariants that they protect or all the data they protect. And this is a biggish lock. Um, the other interesting thing is that you can acquire a lock in an interrupt routine. Which not that easy. Okay. Um, in particular, you should be asking yourself, what if the interrupted code already held that lock? That is, what if the interrupt com co comes in while the kernel is executing IDERW and it's holding the lock? And then the interrupt routine needs to acquire the lock. And these, therefore, would need to wait for IDERW to release the lock. But since we've interrupted it and it's not executing anymore, it won't release the lock. So that description is BS, but, um, but there's a little bit of machinery to ensure that that can happen. OK, so how do we implement these blocks? Or how does XP6 implement these blocks? Um, there's a obvious broken way to do it. Um, so first of all, I want to have some pieces to clear the type of objects that are blocks. So um, the struct. Lock. And I'm just going to have a variable that's in the lock. 
set to one, that means the lock is held, and if it's set to zero, that means the lock is not held. And this is actually basically what the testing does. So it's just a little piece of data, one that's locked, zero is not locked. So now I need to write a quiet. Required to lock is an argument. One possibility, a broken possibility, is that I have a loop. So of course I have to have a loop because the choir is supposed to wait until the lock is no longer held before it returns. So it has to sort of at some level have a loop. Um, so I'm going to say while one, and I'm going to test the lock. Right? If the L arrow lock is zero, then that means the lock's not held. It's good for me, right? You just set the lock. And it worked. And so logically, at least, this is more or less sort of what happens inside of one. So why is it nevertheless broken? What would go wrong? Yeah. Yeah. So the race in it. This is exactly the kind of race in it that locks are meant to avoid. Namely, this pair of lines. You can imagine two cores are trying to acquire the same lock. They both execute the first line. They both see the lock's not held. So they'll say, oh, the lock's not held. And then they both set the lock to be locked. And they both return to the caller saying, you have the lock. Right? So this the problem is this, these pair of lines have to be atomic. Right? We, we need to, the two, these two things, the checking and the setting, to sort of somehow be one atomic operation that nothing can slip in between them in the middle. Um, so you can't do it with this code. <clears throat> If you're curious, there is a way to actually write a choir in using standard instructions like this, but we're not going to do it. Um, in fact, what XC6 and everybody else does is take advantage of basically special hardware support for locking. Um, the x86 hardware and every other self-respecting microprocessor have a low-level hardware notion of locks built in. And we're going to just piggyback on top of that. Um, so what this looks like is that um, there's a, on the x86, there's an instruction called exchange. And the way you, we use it, you give it a register and an address, which right, and the address is going to happen to be the address of this lock, deal in our lock. And what the exchange instruction does is atomically, the hardware um, Swaps the value in the register with um, the value of that address. And so, in fact, we set up EAX to hold the one. We tell the hardware to run exchange instruction. It swaps our one in EAX with the contents of address. That means that what address points to is now set to one, and EAX has the previous value. If the previous value was zero, that means the lock wasn't hold, held, and we just set it to one in an atomic operation. If the value of EAX is 1, that means the lock was already held. That was the old value of the address was 1. But since we swapped 1 into it, it's still locked. Right? So you have to call exchange and look at EAX. If EAX is 0, that means the lock wasn't held. And we win. We unlock now. If EAX is 1, then, um, then somebody else had the lock and we had to try again. So, uh, so in fact, the acquire in XP6 is, is this loop. Um, basically, L1, the exchange one with L arrow, this is really L arrow lock. Um, and if EAX is equal to zero, then we win. Right. What this does internally um, is, at least in the x86, is that. Well, here, here's, here, here's, here's a way of thinking about it that's sort of logically correct, but not what actually happens. So let's go back to this old scheme in which, that I already put up, in which you have a bunch of CPUs attached to the system bus. They can only get out the system bus once a time and then use the talk to the game across the system bus. Right? Um, uh, well, <laughs> Let's just say that there's a special gadget 
um, called the lock gadget in hardware. Okay? And all the CPUs have a line with a lock gadget saying, I want to win, you know, I want to win. And the lock gadget sort of sends back a yes to only one of the CPUs at the time. Right? And then when that CPU says, oh, I'm running the hardware lock, then the lock can uh, give the hardware lock to a different CPU. Um, and this is actually very close to what happens in the real machine. The only difference is that for performance, there's a sort of notionally a separate lock for each address, let's say. And so the lock gadget says, for it, you can have a lock for address AB. You can have a lock for address A. And so this, this really is direct hardware support for a notion of locking, of locking an address. And do, while I hold the lock for that address, I do I execute this exchange instruction, and then I release the lock. All right, um, and you can see this like directly in our well, first spinlock.h. For our purposes, line three is the line that really matters. A lock just has this one field that's one of its locks and zero of its unlocked. Um, the remaining two fields are just for debugging. They have nothing to do with actual lock. Um, and the implementation. Um, for us, part of the implementation we've already seen is at line 34. That is, the x 6 implementation calls exchange, and exchange is basically a macro for this uh, instruction. Right, so, acquire just sits in a loop calling this exchange, this atomic exchange instruction, um, and keeps on calling it as long as it returns non-zero. That is, that is, as long as the old value of LIR lock indicates that the lock is already locked. And it only drops out of the loop when the old value is zero, that is, it didn't use the lock. Okay. Um, the only other part of this code that's interesting is line 27. What line 27 is doing is turning off interrupts. That is, when you call acquire, interrupts are disabled. And um, they're only enabled again uh, at the end of release. So here we are looking at release. At the very end of release, this pop CLI thing turns interrupts back on. So that means that if I have a fire and then I do a bunch of stuff and then release, interrupts are off for that whole period. And the reason for this um, is for the kind of code that we saw in the IPE driver, where um, the interrupt routine needs to hold lock, and there would be deadlock if the interrupt was allowed to occur while the lock was held. As if we were if we were in an IDE RW holding lock and the interrupt IDE interrupt came in, we would have a dead lock because the interrupt routine can't see until it acquires a lock. But the lock's already held. Um, and so this turning off of interrupts between acquire and release um, prevents this deadlock from happening. So interrupts are turned off globally for all the No, just for this core. Because of the interrupt, that's a great question. If the interrupt comes in on a different core, on a core, on a core that is not holding the lock, then it can simply wait for us to release. And we won't be able to release. It's not a deadlock because it's really the interrupt and the fact that the interrupt freezes the interrupted process that sort of causes the deadlock. Uh, and so typically, yeah, the interrupt will actually happen on the core, so we don't pay much for turning off the interrupt. All right, any questions about how acquire works? No. Um, all right. Um, OK, so one thing that's, that's worth seeing here is that these, are, these locks wait in a while. For that reason, they're called spin locks. They're sitting there burning up CPU time in acquire if somebody else holds the lock. So, this kind of lock, these spin locks, because of that while loop, um, they are great if the critical section, that is the amount of time you hold a lock, is short. Right? You typically acquire a lock and then you increment some variable or add something to a linked list and then call release. These spin locks are, are excellent because that means that if somebody else needs a lock, they only spin maybe once or twice before you give up the lock. But if you lock around anything expensive, like you acquire a lock and then read the disk and then release the lock, these spin locks are a disaster because anybody who's waiting for that lock you hold is spinning in this wild loop for a long period of time. Um, 
you wish somebody else could have been making, some other program, some other process could have been making good use of those CPU time. So most serious systems actually have multiple kinds of locks. Uh, spin locks for short critical sections, um, where you only hold the lock for a very short amount of time. And typically they have a totally different kind of lock, um, where the semantics are, if you try to acquire the lock that's already held, then you yield the CPU and let another process run um, until the lock is released. So those are typically called blocking locks. The real operating system would have both spin locks and blocking locks. x 6 has only spin locks, although it has some other things, which we'll see later, which sort of are a very crummy ad hoc implementation of blocking locks. All right. Well, I guess I won't see you again, but <laughs> Ron, we'll see you next week. <laughs>